This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. So on Socialist yes. News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. You've been with us a few times before, and uh, of course, most recently was the special we called A Brief History of Settler Colonialism. Uh, can you just remind folks who you are? Uh, yeah, so my name is Anthony. Um, <clears throat> I am a union organizer by day. Um, I've been, um, you know, an organizer and activist, um, you know, for a number of years now, uh, primarily in like Palestine solidarity work, um, anti-war work, um, <clears throat> but also, you know, like within labor organizing and, and a lot of other struggles. Um, I'm a member of Minnesota Workers United. Um, we're, you know, uh, a group of rank and file workers, other folks within the labor movement, um, within the Twin Cities kind of organizing a, a, a broader basis of, of labor uh, and union work um, on like a class struggle basis, which is, you know, like internationalist and anti-racist and anti-sexist and all of these things that very much exist within our labor movements, um, right. but also, you know, um, are really critical things um, in combating in order for, you know, uh, the forward progress for the liberation that we all want to see and uh, aspire to struggle towards. Yeah, and you know, last time uh, we talked just briefly uh, before we got off about your thesis uh, that you had written, and you had you sent that uh, to me after the last interview. Um, I did have that opportunity to go through and uh, to go through and read it. Um, and we want to focus a little bit more on the current uh, uh, mm -hmm. period because we got into the history before, but just to kind of, um, you know, kind of review the historical piece I read from your thesis, quote, the diverse indigenous nations of Turtle Island did not undergo a feudal mode of production prior to the introduction of capitalism and imperialism. Uh, therefore, reengaging with Marxist theory is necessary, end quote. Um, so there you're talking about the theory of primitive accumulation, um, you know, and kind of this idea of going through you know, stages or whatever that we, that we would see in like a certain kind of socialist discourse. Uh, can you briefly outline the history of the introduction of capitalism to Turtle Island and, and touch on how primitive accumulation does or doesn't apply um, in that scenario? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I guess something I left out of my introduction, like if anybody's listening, they're like, well, like, why the hell does this guy, Anthony, <laughs> get to say anything about this? Um, so uh, so I have a, a degree in American Indian Studies uh, from the University of Minnesota, I'm also a descendant of Menominee Nation uh, and I'm the Kudori Ojibwe. Um, so all those things, you know, uh, formulate who I am, like as an activist and organizer and how I go about labor work and, you know, anti-war work and all those things. Um, and it also, you know, influences, um, you know, the things that I wrote about, like in this thesis, as you probably um, could tell. So a little background on that um, to preempt that. So, yeah, so I think the thing to, to remember about, you know, specifically like the creation of the United States um, and, you know, talking about the introduction of capitalism and what that means is that, you know, it's easy to think of like the United States today, right? We see from the Atlantic to the Pacific and, you know, continental United States is 48 states and, right? But, you know, that that's not how settlement and the colonization of that same land base happened. It didn't, like, it didn't happen in, in one event, right? right? Like we're talking, you know, westward expansion over the course of, you know, 250 plus years. So that means that like various indigenous nations are introduced to uh, to European settlers, whether they're Anglo or Spanish or French, um, they're introduced to them at different points in time. And that also means at different points of technological development. Um, that also means at different points of, of industry and things like that. So, you know, I can't really speak as an expert as to like what that means for, um, you know, like Diné people in like the Southwest of the United States or, you know, um, 
nations all over. But so like what I, I looked at was specifically in like the state of Minnesota, um, which is, um, you know, at the time of, of kind of like first contact and, and large scale settlement is Ojibwe people, Ho-Chunk people and Dakota people um, by and large. And so, you know, like settlement doesn't really happen in, you know, this territory that we're on now. Um, in a large scale until like the mid 19th century century. Um, like there are like small swaths of, of settlers before that, but the first actual influx of settlers in the attempt to like really occupy the land is the middle of the 19th century. And so it's important to think about like where um, the productive forces are at that point in time, right? Like where the, where industry is and all these things. So when this happens, um, you know, prior to this, like there is trade, right? Like there's like the fur trade is like really, um, really kind of important in the early 19th century uh, in this region. That really kind of, of goes out of style by like the mid 19th century. And so we have like uh, the rapid expansion of industry happening within Europe at this time, um, the development of new technologies. Um, and so what's happening at this time is largely this immediate change from from trade into um the extraction of resources like timber um you know we're also seeing like development of large-scale infrastructure like uh like the railroads um you know which is happening in the mid-19th century um but really you know by like 1862 with the pacific railways act like we see like really large scale um introduction of of infrastructure um to the railroads and things like that um but also as um as minnesota becomes an official territory in you know i think it's 1848 um i i might be off by a couple of years on that um but between that and statehood in 1858 i mean like we see like 150,000 settlers come into this territory, right? Like we go from like 3,000 settlers in the territory to 150, you know, like it's almost nothing. And so what happens when that many people come into this territory, right? Um, obviously they all have immediate access to land that is not theirs. Like that's right. kind of like the crux of, of, uh, of settlement, right? Um, but also, right, all of these production forces are being built up. So these settlers are immediately thrown into the productive forces um, of being laborers, right? Mm -hmm. So like we go from trade almost instantly to um, to labor, right? So like mm -hmm. cities and towns are being built up. So like St. Paul as the capital of Minnesota, um, Stillwater is really important at this time. Also like Minneapolis, of course, too. Um, but so like we see like industry and, um, and business like just immediately kind of pop up everywhere like in these 10 years. Um, and so, you know, like kind of thinking about what that means for indigenous nations, right? Um, because, you know, Marx's theory of primitive accumulation is, is really, it's, he's like looking at the enclosure of the commons and, and how that worked in Europe. Right. Um, and so, you know, like his theory is not wrong in terms of how it functions in Europe, but right. Like there is no feudalism. There's no feudal mode of production right. on this land <laughs> in which we transition to capitalism. Right. So there's something else entirely in which we, we transition and, you know, there's not even really a transition. It's just kind of supplanted, right? Like mm -hmm. um, capitalism is kind of like the first immediate mode of production um, that happens here in what is now the state of Minnesota. Um, and also what this means is, right, so there's an influx of, of settlers that become laborers. But what does this mean for indigenous people, right? Um, thinking about like Marx's theory of primitive accumulation, it is, you know, the peasantry are removed from the commons, you know, mm. like this common lands. And, you know, really like the point of this is to push peasants into uh, urban centers where production is happening and they become laborers and they're proletarianized, right? So mm -hmm. the peasantry, you know, transitions in, into wage laborers. That doesn't happen with indigenous people, right? One, ind indigenous people um, in indigenous nations were they're not a peasantry, right? Because um, there's right. not this, this feudal mode, right? Mm -hmm. um, but with this dispossession of land that happens both with the enclosure of the commons and with the theft of indigenous lands, indigenous people aren't proletarianized at this time. They're entirely removed from the process mm. of wage labor. 
And like, and that's not to say that like there aren't some sure. um, indigenous people that that sold their labor at this time, but as as a political class of people, they're not proletarianized. Um, you know, um, there are some you know uh, specifically like uh, Ojibwe men um, around this time, uh, as well as like Menominee, um, who who are working like in in um, the the timber industry and lumber mills and things like that. But it, it, it's really not on on any like uh, systemic scale in which they're they're um, proletarianized. So like there's this like really big difference in how the introduction to capitalism happens and how it exists for indigenous people. So rather than being put into the fold of being wage laborers, they are entirely removed from the process of 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 proletarianization entirely, um, because that's kind of the function of North American settler colonialism. Right. Um, specifically, I would say like uh, American colonialism, um, which is that there is this desperate need to bring in settlers, right? So that you do not need to rely on indigenous people for right. this wage labor, right? Because, uh, you know, the more that you are able to keep indigenous people somewhat in line with you, right? That makes like the contradiction of the land, like the attempt to dispossess the land it makes it harder to maintain that, right? Because you're yep. also building up um, the power and the forces of these indigenous nations um, kind of all over the country. Um, but so before I like go on any further, um, hopefully that like kind of answers some of what you're, yeah. you're asking. Um, obviously, right? Like it's, it's a much larger answer. And I mean, it's, I, mean I think but, it also shows that, you know, this idea that there's like these stages that are really like, clear and defined and you know there's hunter gatherers and there's feudalism and there's capitalism and there's socialism or whatever like that is not certainly not the full story (laughs) and there's a lot more nuance and uh muddiness to how all that comes together you know what comes before and how we get to where we're going and some people may go different routes than others and maybe you know uh put into different categories by their oppressors uh you yeah. know by the settlers etc and you know so there's so there's a lot more there's a lot of stuff going on and that hasn't been fully um you know uh dealt with by a lot of socialists uh and marxists as far as like integrating that into the theories that we're that we're working with or even looking at that really in a lot of cases yeah well i think more so i mean i think some i, I think many understand this to a certain degree you know maybe not fully but i think that's just like lack of of study um but but i think like what's actually the bigger problem is that there's this i would say like uneducated assertion that that contradiction you know ended in like 1860 or something like that or 1870 and i think like that's kind of the bigger problem um and you know i think like the question of like labor in regards to settler colonialism is really like the big question that, Mm. you know, kind of divides people. Um, And I'll say, you know, as, as a a labor organizer and a, and a unionist, right. Um, You know, I, uh, I don't fall on the side that, you know, like the labor movement uh, has no role to play in any of this. Right. Or that, um, or that, uh, unions are inherently reactionary. I don't, I also don't think that they're like inherently revolutionary. No. Um, but I, there are contradictions there uh, in terms of the ways that non-Indigenous people in the United States um, are, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, I would say, you know, um, granted benefits um, for the continued dispossession of mm. land and resources. And, and that hasn't ended so I think like talking about today specifically, right? We can talk about 21st century. Right. Um, like, okay, what does that mean? Like in Minnesota, right? Because somebody could say, well, okay, yeah, that was a thing in, in 1860, but certainly, right? Like, you know, like the working class in the United States is exploited by, by business owners, by the bourgeoisie, right? And yeah, that's true, right? But there can also be contradictions with, with inside of this. And so mm-hmm. what I've seen is people say that, you know, like, well, you know, like a, a white worker, a white union worker, like doesn't benefit whatsoever from, you know, mm. dispossession of, of indigenous land in, right. in 2024. And what I would say to that is like, it's just patently false. Right. And so like, 
so, you know, like we can look at, you know, um, this is actually something um, that uh, is on the Red Nation podcast um, that I did with Nick Estes. Mm-hmm. And we we talk about um, uh, union pipeline workers, um, specifically uh, on the Dakota Access Pipeline, but it's not exclusive to to Dakota Access Pipeline. And right. it's line three, it's line five, it, it's, it's every pipeline. It's, you know, anywhere where there's an extraction of resources, um, specifically right. in and around um, reservation land now. But, you know, at, at the time of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which, you know, now we're talking like the mid 2010s, um, <clears throat> there was this uh, emergence of, you know, what we now call like the water protector movement, right? Mm-hmm. Like indigenous people, fighting to protect their own resources, right? Um, And who was there to actually do the job, right? Who was there to actually sell their labor to extract these resources? It was union pipeline workers, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and like, and like, that's not me saying that, you know, that the union workers are inherently bad, but if those union workers are to have real, solidarity and a true internationalist lens, right? And we talk about like, what is their role with right. settler colonialism, right? I would argue as a unionist, the labor movement's role is to say, we're not fucking doing that job, right? right. right? Because Agreed. these people are saying they don't want it, right? The, the, the people of this land are saying, we don't want you extracting our resources. This is ours. You have taken enough, right? Um, and so, you know, that's like what the labor movement's role is to do. But what did we see? We saw uh, we saw unions go and say, like, oh, we we can't reject the pipeline right. because that because that's union work. That's jobs. It's it's union. Jobs. Good union jobs. It's, it's jobs. But, you know, like uh, not all work is good work, man. Exactly. You know, and. And, and not all union jobs are jobs that we should be fighting for, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if and, and this isn't just exclusive to like you know settler colonialism, but you know if the work is fundamentally damaging and destroying right you know, exactly the community around you, then like you know our job within the labor movement is to say no, no way, like we're not doing it, right? Um, so you know I, I that's like where I would push back on yeah. really easy answers as to like you know like. What do workers today benefit from dispossession? Right. Because because this is you know 2015, 2014, 2016, and we're talking about active disp- uh, dispossession and uh, accumulation of resources of Dakota people, right? And mm-hmm. this is less than ten years ago, right. and these workers are fundamentally benefiting from this if they do this work. Uh, I, so no, yeah, I was just I was just going to say, and your your um your thesis was specifically. Uh, focused on the University of Minnesota uh, for the most part. Um, and the title was the foundations of Minnesota of the Minnesota territory settler imperialism and the land grab university of Minnesota. And um, I think, you know, to continue to look at our current situation as it applies to settler colonialism, we should kind of start at the end of your thesis to see how this process is kind of like an ongoing, like kind of thing that feeds into itself. Um, You wrote uh, at the end, quote, is the University of Minnesota using the blood money from indigenous people of Turtle Island to invest in other projects of genocide, land theft or further destruction and exploitation of indigenous people today? End quote. And we saw students at the University of Minnesota set up an encampment to push the university to divest from Israel um, as they continue to, um, you know, kill Palestinian people on their own land. Um, You know, and so, you know, the university. University is in, engaged in supplying Israel uh, and its proxies with funds uh, while they're methodically displacing and exterminating Palestinian people on their own land. Um, you know, so the short answer to that question is yes, uh, that is happening. Um, can you, uh, you know, paint a fuller picture of how this, you know, process is continuing to repeat itself and 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 feed into itself in 2024? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as you. Um clearly figured out the question I posed was rhetorical. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, to give a little bit of background as to like what that means is, you know, the University of Minnesota is a land, what we call a land grant institution, um, which essentially means that the university um, is funded by, uh, it's kind of like initial startup funds um, are entirely uh, predicated on 
stolen land of indigenous nations. And like, this isn't like an abstract kind of thing. Like, right. um, you know, the university of Minnesota, um, actually, um, was essentially out of funds, um, you know, by around like 1858. Um, it had been a territorial university for a few years before that. Um, but it was able to, to, to reopen, um, after the 1862 moral land grant act, um, which, uh, essentially it takes, um, large swaths. I mean, we're talking like hundreds of thousands, millions of acres of, of indigenous territory, um, some of which is treated land, some of which, um, you know, is outright stolen. Um, <clears throat> and it takes uh, parcels of land. And in the case of the University of Minnesota, immediately, it's like somewhere around like 90, I think 4,000 acres of territory, um, which come from just two treaties, the 1854 Treaty of uh, Traverse de Sioux and uh, the 1854 Treaty of Mendota. Um, and it takes, you know, right, like roughly about 94,000 acres, and it hands it over to the University of Minnesota. And it says, listen, you need money, take these 94,000 acres, and do what you need to in order to make money and fund your school. So, you know, a lot of it, like they just kind of immediately sell off. Mind you, this is indigenous territory, right? And they're just, they're taking it and they're selling it. Um, so who are they selling it to? They're selling it to, to business. They're selling it to other settlers, right? Um, so, you know, it's accumulating uh, resources and capital and it's staying in the hands of, of the settler class. Um, <clears throat> but so, you know, not only are they selling this land, they also lease this land. Um, what I think is probably most important is that they retain um, the rights to uh, like minerals and resources. Mm. And they continue to lease out these rights um, still today, like right. the University of Minnesota today literally still leases mineral rights. Um, you know, I believe right now um, the University of Minnesota is um, close to an agreement or already um, in agreement to lease out um, taconite to like some subsidiary mm. company of, of Tesla um, to do taconite mining, um, you know, for like... Uh, for, you know, I don't know, a cyber truck or something stupid right. like that. Um, but, you know, this is like a continued dispossession, right? Like this is this is like a dispossession in 2024 that we're talking about, an extraction of indigenous resources, right? But these are, these are all funds that the University of Minnesota gathers over 160 years and they still have. Um, you know, these funds go explicitly into a fund called the Permanent University Fund. Um, and this fund is only for these land grant monies right mm. and the only thing that they can really do with with this money is they can use a very small amount of it for things um today but what they can also do with it is they can reinvest these funds into other things um and then the the capital gained from that can go back into this fund and so right now as of 2024 um grist dot uh dot org or dot com i forget um they do really amazing work um <clears throat> has found that the permanent university fund as of today is right around one billion dollars okay and that one billion dollars stems from only one place and it is from indigenous land it is from mm. native nations land that is the only place where this this money comes from, right? Like that's where it starts from. It comes from this initial primitive accumulation of stolen land, right? And it allowed the University of Minnesota to not only stay open, but to continue to have, you know, these large scale endowments that like, you know, it, it's just a corporation now, right? Like right. education is really not, you know, the primary university's primary yeah. function, yeah. but especially land grant universities. Um, but so there becomes a question of like, okay, well, what are they then investing these funds in? Um, as you talked about, right, the encampments, um, one of the, the key demands that, you know, the really amazing student organizers had uh, around um, divestment was also opening up the books to saying where they are sending their money and what they are investing in. Um, right. And they've really only opened the books a little bit. Um, but that is really where the question lies, right? So are you taking these funds that came directly from the land theft of Dakota people and used it to invest in Elbit systems or 
um, you know, Caterpillar, right? Um, because I think we know that the University of Minnesota does invest in Caterpillar, right? Which you know, like builds, um, you know, these giant like literal bold- bulldozers that are explicitly made to tear down houses mm. and walls, and like I mean, they're an active part of violent settlement in occupied Palestine right now, right? Um, and so like that's where the question comes in, right? Like, are these funds? being directly invested in this current genocide. Um, I think the safe bet is probably yes, Um, but even if not directly, even if Mm. those direct permanent university funds aren't being used, every single thing that the University of Minnesota has today is indirectly from these stolen lands. So, you know, the answer unequivocally is yes, right? Like the University Mm -hmm. of Minnesota did use the blood money of genocide and dispossession of Dakota people and Ojibwe people um, and Ho-Chunk people um, to to actively fund the ongoing genocide in Palestine right now. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know, and we're seeing, as as mentioned with the encampments, we're seeing more, um, you know, people becoming aware of the situation clearly, especially with the, uh, you know, bombing in Gaza. People are, uh, you know, waking up and realizing what's going on. Now they're, you know, the question is like, how do we do something about it? But it seems like there's a lot of people getting active. Are you, I don't know, you feel hopeful or or positive about the, you know, this new kind of like wave of people uh, kind of realizing what's going on? Or do you think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's going to kind of go by the wayside like so many uh, of these things have before? What's your thought? I mean, uh, I think it's a complicated answer, but, but I think, you know, I think like as revolutionaries, the answer has to be, yes, I'm optimistic, right? right? Um, We have to believe that we are actively struggling towards something good. We are actively struggling for the future that we want to see. And it doesn't mean that everything's perfect. And it doesn't mean that, you know, it might not feel like we're always taking steps forward, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, I think like whatever, like I might be feeling internally, I, I think the answer always has to be yes. Like we have to always be under the belief that we are doing what we need to be doing. Um, and a lot of the times, especially within the United States, it means that like we are not at where we need to be at or where we want to be at. Um, but we have to be under the belief that we are actively struggling towards the correct path forward. Right. Um And so, you know, I think what that means for, you know, the broader base of people, you know? Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, Republicans don't give a shit. And I think, you know, I think we know after this last election that, you know, Palestine is a really important issue for many, many people. Um, But, you know, um, whether, you know, the the tried and true blue no matter who voters – um, where they're at these days, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, whether they're a part of that process, I would say they're not a part of this process right now. Um, yeah. But you know, we also have you know tens of millions of people who didn't vote, people oh, yeah. who are you know feel disenfranchised, depoliticized, a apolitical, whatever, mm-hmm. from this process for one reason or another. Um, and I think like if we look all over the country, you know, maybe like the movement has slowed down a little bit um, in many ways. Um, maybe that's from burnout. Maybe it's because, you know, our tactics haven't always been correct or, you know, mm-hmm. we've, we've made some some mistakes along the way. Sure. But, you know, I, I think the level of consciousness of, of people is raising, which is critically important. You know, I was um, I, I've said I, I grew up in South Minneapolis um, and I was just over um, in Little Earth, um, you know, I think a couple of nights ago. Mm. And, you know, there was. um you know, a number of, of Native women who, who spoke um, over at Cedar Field and, you know, are doing like really important community care work, you know, in South Minneapolis and Little Earth. Um, but all of them talked about the critical importance of recognizing the solidarity that we have to have as native people with palestine Mm. you know and we see it over and over again you know um people that talk about like you know these are the same struggles while they you know they have their differences and their own uniquenesses right like we are battling the same beast right 
And many of the tactics that the Palestinian people um, are, are victim to are the same types of tactics that, uh, that indigenous people here uh, have been victim to, right? And we continue to fight back uh, in spite of it, right? Because, you know, this this isn't an absolute. It doesn't have to end this way, right? Right. Um, so I, that's what I would say to that, right? Is uh, it, we, we, we have to be optimistic that we are organizing and struggling towards something better. Yeah, and on the labor piece, I mean, you know, the, this, I, this idea that, you know, the, 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 the settlers and the universities and powers that be take this money that they've made off, you know, stealing land and everything. And then again, put it into stealing more land or, you know, bulldozing houses. Like there's a similar case you can make, you know, with obviously with the labor movement, right. These, these companies, these corporations, even, you know, universities, they say, Oh, they don't have any money. They can't you know, support you. They can't do anything, but then they take all this money that you've made them right. <laughs> like through exploitation. And then they can hire like millions of dollars to hire some like, uh, union busting law firm or like when I was you know when I was out with the Northwest mechanics way back in the day and they hired like Vance security to be there like 24 hours a day like mm. videotaping the picket lines it's like okay yeah. you can do that but you can't you know you can't actually provide the things that that people need and I think that you know that there's a good you know and that they're making that same money right off the exploitation of labor the exploitation mm -hmm. of you know of, of people's land and then they're using that against them so as much as we can uh limit their ability to have those uh you know those funds that they've stolen from all of us uh the better we can um uh you know force them to actually uh listen to us and actually to uh take these movements seriously so we have to you know yeah. we have to cut off their funds basically and that's the no, yeah and i think that's that's actually like a really good and important way to look at you know uh you know, revolutionary movements and like labor in the United States, mm -hmm. which is that like, you know, there is like, you know, like this dual tension, you know, like um, there is, you know, obviously the the class contradiction of, of worker and and owner, right? Mm -hmm. um, like that very obviously exists, right? Like if, if I said that it didn't, right, I wouldn't be a Marxist. Uh, <laughs> right. But, um, you know, there there is still this contradiction of of indigenous people as as citizens of of indo of um, sovereign indigenous nations, right? And the continued attempt to uh, to dispossess them of land, right? Um, and so, like it, like I said, it like creates this dual tension of like these things both exist at the same time. And you know, I talked about like you know native people like weren't proletarianized in the mid 19th century i mean native people are proletarianized now obviously right like native people are are workers and you know all the ways that everybody else is a worker today right um so like that does actually change things a little bit in in what it looks like but i think what it needs to look like is you know the example of the pipeline right like um union workers need to come together and and laborers who are unorganized right coming together to reject the dispossession of land, right? To stand with the struggles of indigenous people inside and outside of labor. Mm -hmm. right? um, but I think on the flip side, that looks very different in Palestine right now because they're at different places and um, different, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say stages, but, you know, uh, they developed differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, a lot of people will point to like the PFLP in Palestine and like the PFLP brings up like the contradictions of like the Palestinian bourgeoisie and the Palestinian working class, which, you know, mm -hmm. obviously exists. Right. Um, but my question to anybody who, who wants to bring that up in, in any real sense is, well, is the PFLP fighting alongside the Israeli labor unions or are they fighting alongside Hamas? Right. Mm -hmm. And they're fighting alongside Hamas because it's, it's a question of national liberation. Right. Um, and that question of national liberation is on the basis of settler occupation. Right. Um, and so I, I think like that's where Palestine and the United States slightly differ right now, because mm -hmm. like, I would argue that there isn't an Israeli working class. There's only an Israeli settler class. Um, Whereas in the U.S., they've already done all that. They've already done all, the majority of the displacement and everything like that. And, you know, like you said, the indigenous people are proletarian, proletarianized. 
Is that the word that were that you used? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sure. sorry. But uh, <laughs> the um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, indigenous people. There's still a huge group of you know indigenous people that are some of those like mar- socially marginalized people ever. Yeah. You see, you know, the the DOJ report on the police killings. You know, between 2010 and 2020, indigenous people are the most killed by police, even though they only make up 3% of the population. Um, you know, I mean, there's still a, you know, there's still an ongoing, um, you know, obviously intimidation and, um, you know, I mean, again, and the, you know, the, the, the indigenous in, encampments, a lot of uh, unhoused folks or other folks that, you know, they're getting moved off the land, right? Uh, you know, yeah. where they then don't have anywhere to live. So, I mean, in a certain sense, you know, it's it's ongoing everywhere, but the most, you know, vicious, cruel and stark example is obviously going on right now. Um, at least one of those is going on right now in Palestine. Um, yeah. And, and I know we're, you know, we're just about at time. Yeah. So um, I'll just like kind of wrap up again. Yeah. You know, like there's so much more that could be said um, yeah. and elaborated on within all these things. But, you know, I think like right now within the United States, um you know uh the role of the working class has to be to align under the banner of fighting against settler colonialism in which uh really overwhelmingly right is so detrimental to indigenous people but also black people um which we haven't even talked about how settler right. colonialism um affects you know the black nation within the united states um but you know the working class you know we have a responsibility to fall um under the the absolute understanding um that you know indigenous people and black people are there is no liberation after this if we maintain the current order of dispossessed and stolen land just fundamentally right um and so that's kind of like where I'll, where I'll end this. Well, I really appreciate you speaking with me. Thanks so much. And that's our special interview. Thanks for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.